morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Westminster and to our inclusive family of faith. We especially welcome our visitors and those joining us on YouTube. Please sign the friendship pad and pass it down the row so we can greet each other by name. Quilters have moved to the first Fridays of each month, and as we approach the end of the year, they'll be meeting twice each month. So if you can tie quilts or are willing to learn, join them this Friday in Fellowship Hall at 9 o'clock a.m. Save the date now for our all-church workday coming up this Saturday, October 5th from 8 a.m. to noon. Bring your tools and your gloves to help spruce up the, our building and grounds. If you have any special skills or questions, please see Carol Rayburn or Zeb Wright, our property elders. Next Sunday, we will receive the Presbyterian Peace and Global Witness Offering, which equips peacemakers in congregations and around the world. There's an insert in your bulletin that tells you more about it. And now we have a video to share a glimpse into, the peace, into these peacemaking efforts. Peacemaking is central to the gospel and the mission of the church. Peace is possible, and it begins with us sowing the seeds of peace in every interaction and decision we make. The Confession of 1967 invites the church to be emissaries of peace. It also reminds us that, with an urgency born of this hope, the church applies itself to present tasks and strives for a better world. Through our gifts to the Peace and Global Witness Offering, we are able to participate in work that we would not be able to do on our own. These gifts combine with churches across the PCUSA to sow seeds of peace around the world. Through the offering, the Central America Migration Mission Network helps seek solutions to the root causes of migration in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. The offering helped the Presbyterian Church of Waynesboro, Pennsylvania and their Loads of Love Laundry program, working to sow seeds of peace through the simple act of washing clothes for those on the margins. The Native Lands Travel Study Seminar, sponsored by the Presbyterian Peacemaking Program, showed participants the implications and legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. After learning that the doctrine gave the government religious and legal justification to claim lands occupied by indigenous peoples, Second Presbyterian Church of Richmond, Virginia, sent funds to help with necessary repairs and improvements to Native American churches, taking the first steps to sow seeds of peace. This World Communion Sunday, let us remember the Christ we meet at the table of grace and affirm that in Christ, all Christians are one, regardless of nationality, race, or ethnicity. Please give generously. For remember, when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. God, you are the bringer of peace. We recommit ourselves to you as you bring peace to our world. May the works of our hands, the marching of our feet, and the meditations of our hearts join with you as we sow the seeds of the peace only you can bring. In your name we pray. Amen. And now let's prepare our minds and hearts to worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. God, whose imagination saw all that is good, beautiful, and loving, continues to see us as beloved children in the divine family. The word which called forth the stars in every universe 
each to us in giving up ourselves through baptismal life. The Spirit, which moved over creation, breathing life into all things, fills us with peace and patience, with hope and healing to share. Now I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our opening hymn, number 452, Open the Eyes of the Heart. We know too well our foolishness, our brokenness, our human ways of doing things, but God knows our hearts, our hopes, our desire to be made new. As we offer our prayers of confession, let us open ourselves to God, who will forgive us and give us new life, praying together. We have been created for goodness by you, artist of all things but we continue to be filled with bitterness. Your word would enable us to speak of joy to others, but we only are only judgment. The spirit which breathes hope into us can be shared with everyone we meet. But we are tempted to hold our breath until we turn blue, rather than giving peace to those around us. But you have said that everything created good even in the foolish children of yours, God of wonder and grace. With the spirit of our sister, we know we can bring healing and hope to those who need it most. With your word, Jesus Christ, as our brother, we know we can tell others of your mercy and of our forgiveness in every moment. Amen. We come here to know mercy, to know love, to know forgiveness. It's in these waters that we are reminded that we are named and claimed as beloved children of God. And so we too are joint heirs with Christ, joint heirs in forgiveness. So let us say the assurance of pardon. Seeing our brokenness, God puts us back together. Knowing our hunger for hope, God feeds us with Christ. Hearing our prayers, God chooses to forgive us. One hope, one faith, one baptism, one body. These are the gifts God gives to us in this moment and all the moments to come. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Alleluia! Amen. Amen. Knowing that we are forgiven, let us share forgiveness with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
You may be seated. I invite uh, any other kids and youth who want to come on down. Uh, now, is, now is the time. And I know Miss Grace will be just right back. Oh, here comes an Ollie. Well, Ollie is showing you guys what I'm going to need your help with today. But let's start and say, good morning, friends. Good morning, Pastor Kate. Oh, I'm glad you know who I am. Miss Brooklyn is off doing busy school board important things. And so I get to hang out with you guys a little bit today. And that means I have to talk to you guys about the Olympics. Did anybody watch the Olympics? A little bit. You did? You did. A little bit. Did anybody watch any of the track relays? Yes. yes. Okay. What 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 is a track relay like? So depending on the most of the time they just run in a circle, and then every like every time they run in a circle, there's different person, and you have to pass a baton. Okay. So unlike a lot of track events, this is it takes a whole team, and you have to pass a baton. Yeah. So I thought, can you guys spread out in a big circle around the sanctuary? I got a baton. Oh, no. Okay, let, let's see if we can practice this. Y'all are welcome to help us practice. Aria and Audrey and Kaylee can help us. All right, Cohen. Cohen, we're going to pass the baton. So can you guys spread out? Some people can go on the side. Cohen, come here. Are you going to be my first baton runner? Okay, Ollie, you go, you go somewhere. Okay. Cohen, what do you do with a baton in a relay race? Hold on. What do you do with it in Olympics? What do you do with the baton? Do you know? You run, and who, what do you do? Do you pass it to someone else? Yes or no? Hey, come here, Co. Are you going to start it? We did not plan this ahead of time. Okay, so Cohen, are you ready? You're going to pretend you're an Olympic track runner, okay? okay. And, and do, you see, do you see Connor down there? Okay. You're going to, Connor, wave. We wave, Connor? You're going to run and give the baton to Connor, Okay. And then he's going to find another kid. Good job. Oh, my goodness. Here it comes. Oh, and there goes Grace. Go, Elena, go. Can you come find Gracie? <laughs> give it to Gracie. Gracie, can you go find Ollie? Can you go find Ollie up there? Go give him the baton. Good job. All right, Ollie, can you find Bert? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Can you grab the baton. Grab it. Can you go give it to Aria? Oh, this way, Bert. <laughs> this way. <laughs> go, find, go find Aria. Good job. Oh, I don't think Reed's gotten to go yet. We don't want to leave Reed out. Here he comes. All right, Reed, bring it home. Whoa. Good job. All right, everybody, come on back. That worked way better than I thought. Was going. All right. Hey, Ollie, stay here, dude. Where are you going? Ollie, come back. We're not quite done yet. Yeah. Okay. If y'all want to scoot down a little bit so I can see your beautiful faces, that's fine. I want to scoot you a little bit. So, what happens if you're running with a baton? and you don't give it up? You lose? Like, if you never gave the baton to someone else, how would your team do? Not great. And somebody might feel sad that they were left out, right? Okay, um, what would happen if you dropped the baton? So in the Olympics, you'd be automatically out. What do you think if someone had dropped the baton running around today, what happened? They pick it back up and try again, right? Because church, we try again, right? Well, I want you guys to think about when you hear the scripture today that God in Jesus passes us a baton. Passing the baton means it's your turn, Audrey. It's your turn, Noli. It's your turn, Grace, right? Passing the baton means now it's your job to go do those things. And so Jesus meets his disciples on a mountain, he has been resurrected, right? And he says, guys, I have something important for you to do. I'm going to pass the baton to you. And I need you, Connor, to go make disciples. I need you, Reed, to go baptize. I need you, Camden, to go teach people. I need you, Olena and Gracie, to obey Jesus. 
Do you guys think you can do that? Can you take the baton from Jesus? What would that look like if you kept running the race Jesus was running? If he passed the baton to you, what does that look like? He trusts you, absolutely. Uh Uh-huh sharing oh oh lena i love that did jesus share a lot in his life yeah 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 and yes gracie yes that's right yes connor So he gave up his life to, so that we could be led forward, so that we can move forward. Oh, okay, Connor's going on a whole other awesome children's sermon here. Jesus gave up the baton on the cross for us to call us into the race. That's right, and then we're, we are going to run and continue that race. So um, when we finish worship each Sunday, I come out in the middle and I say some words and Cohen comes and stands with me, right? I want you guys to start thinking that is every week I'm passing you the baton, right? That I'm reminding you God has passed you the baton. That we don't leave this place and not be Christian anymore, right? But we take it out into the world and that's what we're going to talk about And you know the best news of it all? You're going to have to listen for the very last line in my scripture reading today. God promises when we run this race, when we carry the baton, we're not on our own. Jesus is with us every step of the way. Isn't that cool? So I want you to think about how you can run the baton for Jesus this week. Maybe it looks like sharing or loving Um, maybe it looks like giving someone some food who forgot their lunch or you know those kind of sharing things you do Camden you're good at sharing Um, think about this week okay so are you going to take God's baton we keep Jesus's work going forward all right let's do an echo prayer together you guys ready we fold our hands good job Gracie hey Elena can you fold your hands with me Thank you. you ready? Dear God, Dear God thank, you for loving us thank you for loving us and equipping us, and equipping us to, run race, to run your race. Help us to take the baton, to take the baton as, a as a sign of your grace out into the world. Into the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys very much and for your really awesome running. Anybody got some noisy offering for me? Okay, it's okay. Oh, I'm so the poor. Let us pray. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our epistle reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10, verses 12 through 17. Listen for God's word. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew 8, verse 16 through 20. As I mentioned with our younger people, this is the end of Matthew, the end of of his telling of Jesus' story. So the resurrection has happened, and here's where we pick up. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. How many goodbyes does it take for you to actually leave a social gathering? A couple Christmases ago, there were various articles circulating about the Midwest goodbye. I think I'm glad Ken and Keith and Jim, where am I, and Steve and Jill, where are my Midwest people here? Apparently, it takes 12 steps to do a Midwest goodbye. Y'all can tell me if this is true or not later. The first step is saying, well, in a way that indicates it's time to go. Then you stand up and stretch and ask for your coat because Christmas in the Midwest is cool, right? Oh, but then a forgotten about pie will show up. And so you eat the pie and then you say, okay, so you hug and maybe listen to one or two more stories. You ask for your coat again, but then someone in your family needs to use the bathroom. So then you decline leftovers one more time, more hugs, and you finally reach the door. You put your hand on the doorknob and then your host says, oh! Oh, you know who died. And you talk for 20 more minutes. You make it outside only by this time for another wonderful co- conversation about the wonderful Christmas lights that have come on. And what's the best time of year to put those up? You finally make it to the car only to roll down the window for the last six stories. And you start the engine waving goodbye at your host and anyone and everyone on the street. You've made it, the Midwest goodbye. My children might also tell you that's what it's like trying to leave church when your mom is the pastor. (laughs) We're thinking about how to say goodbye today as we look at the last part of the fourfold order of Presbyterian worship being sent out into the world. Remember, the first part of worship gathers us together, making us into one body. The second part of worship hears the word written and proclaimed. The third part sees us respond with gifts and prayers. And thus, so nurtured, nourished, and transformed, we finally go out back into the world. We go out into the same world we came from, but we are no longer the same. We go out back to our lives, our routines, our work, our school, but now we are marked once more as God's children, forgiven, loved, and freed. In this last part of worship, and it's the shortest of these four sections in your bulletin, we we sing a hymn of sending that both assures us and challenges us to take our faith out into the world to not compartmentalize it or hide it away, but instead to take Jesus' words from Matthew 28 seriously. We then move to the charge and benediction. The charge each week is very much like what Jesus does in our gospel reading. It's ascending out into the world, a list of things you should go and do. The charge I usually speak is drawn from Scripture and offered throughout a lot of Presbyterian churches. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the sick. Honor all people. 
love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that sound a little bit familiar? You should nod. We then conclude with a benediction, which literally means good words. It's the Trinitarian or apostolic blessing that concludes the charge. It's a reminder that we go forth from this place not on our own, but with the presence of the one who sins. Jesus makes it very clear at the end of the Gospel of Matthew that we do not go out into the world on our own. Having risen from the dead, Jesus meets his disciples on the mountain, a motif of divine revelation that happens again and again throughout Scripture. Yet it was not purely a happy occasion. The fact that only 11 of the original 12 disciples gathered reminded the earliest Christians and us of the brokenness that is still in our lives. In the presence of the resurrected Christ, those 11 worshipped him on the holy mountain and some doubted. Worship and doubt in the Bible happen at the same time. And doubt did not preclude Jesus from giving them anyway his own charge and benediction to go, make, baptize, teach, obey. The disciples weren't called to go out and distribute a lot of pamphlets or show up and tell everyone how wrong they are or what some people call drive-by evangelism where you just drive by and say, Jesus loves you. Instead, they were to call others into the same teacher-student relationship they had with Jesus and to replicate that again and again. They were to teach disciples, to teach students, who then would become teachers of other students and so forth, right? Disciples making disciples making disciples. It's a goal then of relationships of going back to that first thing we do in worship, gathering together in Jesus' name. I've always wondered if the disciples were a bit overwhelmed by this charge and benediction, by Jesus' mission for them, by what we now call the Great Commission. After all, one of them didn't make it to this mountain in the first place, and there were no guarantees that their message would be well-received by the Roman Empire. And oh, by the way, how in fact do they disciple the entire world? And I think that's the reason behind Jesus' concluding statement. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The child named Emmanuel, God with us, at the very beginning of Matthew, is now promising to continue to be with them in all their efforts, in all their failures, in all their wins, in all their doubts and worships and discipling. So in our own charge and benediction then, it is important to be reminded that we are not doing this on our own but that we, in fact, are continuing to bear the presence of Christ out of the sanctuary and into the world. And we don't have to eliminate all our doubts or all our fears to be part of this mission. We don't have to have it all together to worship Jesus and be sent into the world. New Testament scholar and seminary professor Dr. Stan Saunders writes that Matthew recognizes that discipleship is lived between worship and doubt, between betrayal and brokenness, and the reality of the resurrection, the reality that hope answers despair. Everything isn't automatically fixed or now easy as we end our hour of worship. Worship has not solved all our problems, even all our faith problems. But it has assured us that Jesus is with us in the ups and downs of discipleship. Some of you know I come from a line of Presbyterians and also a family of really good writers. My uncle Ginger is a deacon and elder at First Presbyterian Church in Waco. 
And for 15 years, he was a caregiver to his wife, my Aunt Marty, who suffered two debilitating strokes that affected her physical abilities, including her speech. I have a picture here. This is our, and you can see Marty in the middle in orange and Ginger right behind her in blue. This picture was our last family Christmas with Marty in 2018 before she passed away the next May. Throughout this time of redefining their love, he kept a blog speaking of both mundane and existential struggles along with kingdom, glimmers of the kingdom hope. One entry in particular that was made early in my own ministry made me see my usual charge as something a lot more. And so here's how he told it, how he wrote about struggling with belief and doubt and being sent into the world. Church services on Christmas Day are sparsely attended because of all of the family functions and the fat man with the beard. It's a toned-down affair where everyone sits at the front for an abbreviated service. Our minister Jimmy was dressed not in his normal robes, but jeans and a plaid pullover hoodie. He greeted Marty and I warmly and helped me sit Mar Marty in our pew, the pew that had been moved over to accommodate a wheelchair. The small crowd settled into their spots around us as Jimmy dipped his hands into the waters of the baptismal font and said, Welcome home, children of God. There we were, Marty in her wheelchair, me dressed in doubt. I knew this was going to be a little different service as Becky, the organist, sat at the grand piano right in front of us and began playing Go Tell It on the Mountain. Marty and her women's chorus rocked this gospel tune many times. It's a toe tapper. Becky was bobbing her head and weaving as she played. Presbyterians being the frozen chosen don't often bob and weave in a church service. As the service progressed, we said prayers and began singing a Christmas carol. Marty loved to sing, but doesn't sing very much anymore. The strokes affected her vocal control, and she can't maintain her pitch very well, and she doesn't like that. But there she sat, in our pew, singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing, just as surely and loudly as the rest of us. I looked up at Jimmy standing behind the pulpit singing, watching Marty singing, and I remember why I loved being there. It wasn't about my belief or unbelief. It was about our belonging to a community of doubters and believers. We moved through the rest of the service praying, singing, and listening. Then as the service came to an end, Jimmy and his associate pastor, Dee Dee, came down from the chancel area to stand between the pews and deliver the charge and benediction. The charge is the same every week. I have heard it. Marty has heard it hundreds of times. It is part of the service Marty knows and loves. It is part of the service that carries great meaning for me. As Jimmy walked past the baptismal font, he once again dipped his hands in the water, shook them off, walked up to Marty and put his hands on her face, connecting Marty to him, connecting Marty to our past, cementing Marty to our faith in a loving God. Jimmy stood and started the charge, go out into the world in peace. Marty, surprisingly, without hesitation, without embarrassment or self-consciousness, said in full voice for all to hear, Have courage. Jimmy looked at Marty and continued, Hold on to what is good. And Marty replied, Return no evil for evil. Jimmy then walked up to Marty, bent over and wrapped his arms around her shoulders and together with her broken memory responding and his gentle reminders, they continued and completed the charge to all Christians, to all people of faith, even those like me who doubt their own belief. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak and help the sick, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. I sat there and struggled to tamp down my own tears 
as I felt Marty's action bring a sense of peace on this day for all who were there. It was no longer about my doubts or my faith. Marty and I went back out the doors of the church through the heavy mist and, still, and across the still deserted road. I put Marty on the lift and in the van and got her locked down in the van, forgetting about my doubts, not worrying at all about what I didn't believe. Through Marty's unrelenting courage to recover and Jimmy's recognition of God's grace through Marty, I remembered. It's not about what I don't understand or struggle over. It's about what God does. And I believe God smiled at us that day through my wife. Friends, Worship is not about what we don't understand or what we doubt or struggle over. It's about what God has done, is doing, and will do. You don't have to leave worship having it all figured out. Worship at its best is bread for the journey, nourishment for our discipleship, encouragement to continue our worship even as we leave this place. The Presbyterian Directory for Worship puts it this way, Christian worship and service does not end at the conclusion of the service for the Lord's Day. We go forth to love and serve the Lord in daily living. In so doing, we seek to fulfill our chief end, to glorify and enjoy God forever. Do you hear that? Our chief and our chief purpose is not to worship perfectly or 100% believe every Presbyterian doctrine or never ever doubt. The chief end of humanity is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. Our commission is to bring that glory and that joy with us into the world teaching other people about the source of the, our strength and the source of our love and the source of our grace in Jesus Christ. So friends, when we come to worship, bring your doubts. There's room here. Bring your brokenness. There's lots of room at the table for that. Bring your insecurities and struggles and lay them at the feet of Jesus here. And then watch Jesus take all of those struggles and doubts and brokenness and use it for the sake of the kingdom. Use it for the sake of making disciples and teaching and showing people the Jesus way and inviting them along. God gathers us. God equips us with the word. God creates space for us to respond. And then God sends us out into the world but never alone. We are always sent with the presence of Jesus Christ, God with us, who is with us always to the end of the age, a God who never has to say goodbye. Amen. Stand as you are able as we join in singing hymn number 610, O 4,000 Tongues to Sing.
Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together using, as we say, how do you live for the love of God? I love because God first loved me. God moves me in Christ with a love that never ends. Amazed by grace, I no longer live for myself. I live for the Lord who died and rose again, triumphant over death for my sake. Therefore, I take those around me to heart, especially those in particular need, knowing that Christ died for them no less than for me. You may be seated. At this time, I invite Reverend Dr. Jim Reinars forward for prayer. For those of you who don't know, Jim is on the board of our uh, national organization, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. And so he is going to be heading out. And if you would tell them a little bit about where you're going. Okay. Uh, if you pay attention to the news and especially the Weather Channel, you know that Hurricane Helene, I think that's how they say it, uh, impacted Florida, but it didn't stop there. It also turned north and has been traveling up through Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and on farther. And it has brought lots and lots of rain and flooding and destruction. And so right now, PDA has a team in Florida, a team in Western North Carolina, and I'll be taking a team into Northeast Georgia Presbytery. Uh, probably middle of this next week, we'll be leaving. And um, I mean, there's a lot I could say that we do when we go out, but for me, one of the most important things is that I go as a representative of this church, this presbytery, the national church, and a representative of our Lord Jesus saying that we love you and we care for you and we're here in your time of need. Absolutely. And an email, don't worry, will be coming out with ways to give and support Presbyterian Disasters Assistance work. Um, but I thought we would take this moment to pray for Jim and for all of those responders um, for everything that's, that's going on. Uh, for those who don't know, there's a, a special Presbyterian place in North Carolina named Montreat, um, where Presbyterians have lived, worked, played for a long time, um, and that area has seen very, very difficult damage. Um, people are still trying to find out if people are okay. Um, so, so we're going to just take this time to pray for Jim um, and, and all of those going through. Creator God, we thank you for this world that you have made and called good. We thank you for these glimmers of your goodness in the midst of hard times. For people like Jim and other PDA volunteers who are showing up, not to get in the way, but to build relationships as people rebuild their lives. God, we pray for all of those who were struck by such severe storms this week. We particularly pray for those in northeast Georgia where Jim is heading to the people of Augusta, for the families who have loved ones who died or were injured. God, we pray that you wrap your loving arms around you. And God, we pray that as we so easily see your image in Jim, that the people he meets this week, the people all our PDA volunteers this week, may see the image of a compassionate Christ who cares for them, who cares for what they are going through, and will show up not just for the short term, but for the long-term recovery that this will take. God, please forgive us as we have not taken care of your creation as we should. Help us to do better, to rebuild in ways that glorifies you and that tends to the good creation that is your earth. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have been entrusted with the greatest news, sin is defeated and Christ is alive. As a sign of our commitment to sharing that news near and far, let us bring our tithes and offerings to God's table. pray. Merciful and gracious God, you abound in steadfast love and faithfulness. With gratitude, we bring our gifts to you. Bless these gifts and bless our lives that together we may share your mercy and grace for the world you dearly love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our final hymn of sending, You Shall Go Out With Joy. Friends, go out into the world. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. 
Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, help the suffering, and tend to the sick. Honor all people, loving and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.